Well, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining me here today. This is Paul Taubman with Nine.Connects, and you are in the right place if you are here for our webinar on footprints, one size fits all. Well, that's what we're going to hear answer here today. So let's get on with it here. Just some housekeeping for you. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we should have some time for questions at the end. And, but in the meantime, if you wish to uh, ask some questions, feel free to write those in. If you do write them in, there is a question panel within the GoToMeeting panel itself. And then as, if you wouldn't, if you'd be so kind, just make sure that when you write the question that you are specific. Um, we, we don't, uh, if, if we're not, uh, if we're talking what I call pronouns, then I'm not gonna be able to understand uh, the question if we uh, have to answer it uh, a couple minutes or some time after you have written the question. So. It's the only quest I make of you. Uh, other than that, uh, sit back and enjoy, and uh, we'll get on with it over here. So let's uh, get through our objectives. Number one, uh, we're gonna look at two elements driving footprint creation. And so we spent some time, this last couple of weeks, spending a lot of time actually trying to figure out what's driving footprint cr creation, but there are two elements of it. Uh, number one is the specifications inherent to the package specifications. And when I say specifications, I'm talking about the package specifications themselves. And we'll be talking about JEDEC here today because uh, they're one of the uh, leaders in that particular area. And we're also going to talk about the specification or specifications driving the lands of the footprint. So these are the two areas that seem to be driving footprint creation. And uh, there is a, a bit of confusion between them, and that's what we're also here to sort out. And of course, we'll give you some recommendations for footprint creation. All right, so with that being said, I would like to start off with our first polling question. So we'll put that up here on the screen so if you can take a moment and take a look at that. And so the question is, uh, uh, you know, where do your parts come from? And you can read that there. And I was kind of curious to know how you're putting those parts together. And of course, you can check multiple boxes in this particular instance. Okay, so I hope you can see the results up here. Um, so uh, a good portion of you, uh, I mean, pretty much 86% of you are making them yourselves with 51% uh, 51, 51 downloading from a third-party service. And to be quite honest with you, we do very much the same thing that you guys are doing here. Um, you have your company library, right, which also helps. And then, uh, and some of you actually also have a company library as well. Um, it is interesting me, for me to see that only 6% of you are actually using external paid uh, third-party service. Um, I was kind of curious to see what that number was, um, but yeah, interesting stuff. Thank you very much for taking that polling question. I think we've got one more for you here, so we'll get that polling question started for you as well. Okay, again, here are the uh, polling results. So looks, it, this is an interesting spread over here, so a very... Um, nothing really stands out. It's just uh, everybody's uh, saying either make them themselves or to uh, download from a third-party service or from a, a company library with, um, again, a paid ser service would be 7% and from a company library would be um, 15%. So it's an interesting thing that uh, on the company library side, a lot of you are using them, but you'd almost prefer that um, it came from, um, you were almost just as happy to do it on your own, some, which is interesting. Okay. So with that being said, thank you very much for taking those polls. So let's let's uh, get into some of the things over here. So we're gonna start off with some assumptions and assumptions are always a dangerous thing, but we do operate off of assumptions in our world of the PCB, uh, of PCB design. And why is that? Because let's face it, most of us were never formally trained in it. We may have taken an EDA tool training. Um, some of you may have actually gone through uh, trainings uh, that were available once upon a time, but the fact of the matter is if you're an electrical engineer, you've had very, very little training, if any, in this, and you probably learned through tribal knowledge, you've learned through personal experience, you've learned through hopefully some of our webinars, but it's it's piecemeal, right? But there are assumptions that that have, have really uh, traversed the entire PCB industry, and there's two of them that we're going to address today when it comes to footprints. So the first one is that manufacturers keep the dimensions of a given package type. So that's the first area we're going to explore. And the second one, that this document, IPC SM782, is the governing document for LANs. So let's keep these two things in mind because that's what drives a lot of our footprints, whether we realize that or not. Okay. So another thing just to frame the discussion, I'm only going to talk about copper LANs today. I'm not going to talk about mechanical layers, silks, paste, or solder masks. We're just simply looking at the copper land. And 
by the way, that's the thing we got to get right anyways, because if we get the land wrong to begin with, all these other things, as great as they are and as helpful as they are and as necess necessary as they are, uh, they're not going to, it's not going to do us any good. At the end of the day, we really got to make sure we have the right copper lands for the components. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about M, N, and L. So when I throw those con concepts out, when I say like an, an N footprint or an M footprint, uh, what we're talking about is the universal three sizes of footprints. I think we're all familiar with. We've seen these because maybe we've downloaded libraries that we have these, or maybe it's even required within your library uh, creation that you have to have these three here. So M meaning the most material or the lowest board density. Uh, so it always it's based it's more area. So if you look at these three over here, the one that's at the bottom is actually an M, right? So it's the most material that you're being that you're providing uh, for the the land. The N is the nominal, so this would be the quote unquote recommended or the uh, the middle of the road type of uh, footprint, at least by older standards. And of course, the least material would be something that would be smaller here, and and that would be for those who are really trying to make the boards a lot denser, so they're trying to really pack a lot more onto it, and they're trying to get whatever real estate that they can from it. So just keep these in mind, because these will appear through the webinar today. Okay, so let's start off in the area of packaging. Okay, so when it comes to packaging, there's an organization that's called JETIC. You probably have heard of them before, but you probably said, well, okay, I've heard of them, but they really don't have any immediate impact to me because I do printed circuit boards and printed circuit boards. I've never heard of their standards for printed circuit boards. And th that you're you're right because they deal with pretty much they deal with the the chip package itself. And we'll get into that here in just a moment. So let's talk about JETIC itself so we can give you a little bit of a background of where they're coming from. It is a joint electron device engineering council, and they were part of an organization called the EIA, the Electronic Industry Association. Now I say they were a part of it because well, in a moment, I'll talk about it. The EIA was comprised of basically five different, we'll call divisions or departments, call it what you may, JETIC being one of them, and then you have uh, four other organizations that were within it. But the EIA disbanded in 2011, and, and but the groups still do exist. So they just, what they did was in 2009, there was an article I came across, and oddly enough, they didn't want to go into the the details as to why the EIA decided that they were going to part ways. And by the way, this organization was started in 1924, so it had been around for a long time. In 2009, they basically said that there was no consensus amongst the groups, which to me sounds like when you're talking to someone who's getting a divorce, and they don't want to get into the ugly details of it. They just say it's just irreconcilable differences. So they don't really tell us if it was political, if it was managerial, if it was financial. If there was nothing of that sort. They just decided that it was time for the EIA to expand and whatever department had created the specification, because there's a, bu a bunch of different specifications that they created, they basically own that asset. So JETIC has their fair share of these documents. And I'm sure if you go into these other ones, one, one of these you will hear about here in just a moment, it looks like they just said like, okay, look, if your department created that specification, you own that specification as, as an asset. So that's kind of how that worked out. Now, JETIC itself gets into a lot of things, but it specifically gets into what I call active silicon. So anything that has to do with the packaging of the active act of the silicon, processes to deal with the silicon, the placement, the bonding, all those things that go on with the silicon, they seem to be setting the standards for that. And here's an example of one of their documents that I was able to get. Um, some of them you do have to pay for, some of them you just have to sign up as a member. You can go to JETIC.org. You sign up as a member and then you get access to their list of their standards. And I pulled this one out just because the standard happened to be available. Okay. So the, this is a perfect example of active silicon. And from what I can see, it looks like they will pretty much handle packages from the simplest of active silicon, which is a diode, all the way up to the most complex BGAs and so on. So that's that's what I've seen with them. Okay. However, they do not specify SMD chip packages. So 0402s, 0603s, that is not in their area. And uh, I did get a confirmation. I sent out an email to JETIC and they were kind enough to respond uh, asking if they had any specifications for these chip packages. And they responded basically saying, no, that's we don't have any specifications of that nature. So who takes care of all the smaller stuff of the passive elements? Well, in doing a little more digging, I came up with the ECIA, and this organization is somewhat new. It's, it was 
basically pulled together just after the uh, EIA had this uh, had basically um, uh, disbanded. So one of the organizations within, remember there's five organizations, JEDEC being one of them, but there was another one called the ECA. They were part of that original EIA. And I don't you love the acronym suit behind all this stuff. And there was another organization that was outside of it called the NEDA, if I remember correct, it was the National um, Electrical Distribution or Distributors Association. They decided to get together and create this new one called the ECIA. Don't you love the acronym suit? But you'd think they all worked for the military. Anyways, the, this is called the Electronic Components Industry Association. This is their website. So there, believe it or not, there's another organization called ECIA out there. They already grabbed that uh, .org website. So that's why they call themselves the ECIA now. They have a packaging specification for what I believe to be the packaging specification. It is called the EIA. So again, it keeps its legacy name, Dash 800. And this document came out in the in 1999, or at least the last version of it came out in 1999. And that makes a lot of sense because that's when, during the 1990s is when all the surface mount stuff really came to fruition. And that's when they would have also started creating specs for that type of thing. But they created a spec for IPDs. Now, more acronym soup for you. What's an IPD? If you never heard of it, I never heard of it either until I looked it up. It is an integrated passive device, which is a nice way of saying a chip capacitor, chip resistor, and so on and so forth. So it, I believe that this is the spec that drives the 0402s, 0806s, and so on and so forth. The only problem is, like a lot of these organizations, that they have the specs, and even if you sign up as a member, they don't give you a preview, and they're not willing to give you the document unless you're willing to pay for it. And yes, I did do some Google searches, and, um, and I just really didn't come across somebody who tried to put it out there because there's a lot of organizations that sell this, uh, like TechStreak, and I think that they are pretty protective about these documents. Um, if they detect anybody putting them out there, they're going to try to get them down off those sites as quickly as possible. So uh, so uh, this is as far as I could really get with it, but this kind of makes sense to me that there is a ruling document out there for these uh, chip capacitors, resistors, inductors, and so on and so forth. Okay, so with that being said, the JETIC and ECIA packaging specifications call out package dimensions, but they generally do not call out the footprint lands. And that's the key thing that I've seen is that they're just going to say, this is how you're supposed to package it. They don't want to call out the lands. They don't think they want to get beyond the package when it comes to um, those type of things. I think they just said, look, we're, with the package and everything within, we're more than happy to take care of it. Outside of that, that's a different domain. We're not going to get into that. And they assume the manufacturer is going to provide the package dimensions and the land pattern. So that the manufacturer is really the interface between the consumer who wants this and the the specification uh, that ultimately drive the manufacturer to build these components. And okay? the land pattern seems to fall on the manufacturer's uh, plate for responsibility as if they call them out. Okay, so there are some questions that came to mind. So, okay, there's specifications out there and that's great, but yet there still seems to be issues with components and that this one size fits all seems to have been problematic for certain people. So we wanted to kind of understand where the where the problems are beginning, where are the issues starting to form. So what we did was we did some experiments. So do the chip manufacturers keep to the specs? That's the first question to ask, right? Because these are just loose, in a sense, they're kind of loosely knit organizations. There's no fines or there's no punishment for an organization to go outside of these. They don't have to follow the specs. The only thing that really drives them to follow the specs, if you really think about it, is the fact that they're competing with other companies and they know that they can swap out their part you know the other company's part if there's an opportunity to do so so a lot of times they want to do that the other reason to do it is because it's a lot easier to work within let's say packaging of common components than to have to constantly come up with a brand new uh, component because then there's a lot of specification and testing that you have to do so you keep to what is uh, what is standard right so that kind of keeps them in line but how well do they keep to that? So one of the experiments we did, and this was really an interesting experiment. I call it an experience, not that we did this experiment on purpose, it was really a result of this webinar, but this, we have a customer library that we're restoring and they requested a generic footprint based on best fit. Now, originally they didn't ask for a generic footprint based on best fit. And the whole reason for this webinar is because their original request, which we thought was a no brainer, 
open up a massive can of worms. And that request was, hey, uh, just give us the N for an 0402 for resistor and an N for an 0402 capacitor. That's what they originally asked for. And of course, when Tom Cassidy and I, my, my colleague Tom, who's done webinars with us here, we thought that was a no-brainer request. Sure, we can do that. And then sure enough, when Tom started digging into it, he realized that that request uh, was not really a valid one. And you'll see why here as we go along here. So ultimately, when we went back to the customer, given that the customer had a number of different footprints, so their, their libraries were really in a bit, bit of a shape, and they just want to have something to start off with, with a quote unquote generic footprint. What Tom did is he thought about it and he says, okay, I'm going to give you what I call a best fit based off of the components that you already have. And moving forward, we encourage you to use the manufacturer's recommended uh, specification. But for just getting this library out the door to a point where they uh, had some commonality, consistency in it, let's do a best fit. So that's that was the plan. And that's why this came about. We got some really great data from this. So it was for the capacitors and the resistors. And let's take a look at this data. Okay. So here were the, uh, this is the capacitor data. And so what they what Tom did was he basically says, okay, for the 0402 packages for the capacitors, I'm going to find the max length, width, and height for all of these. And then I'm going to take the max value because I want to make sure that the max value is going to uh, suffice for this for this uh, for these components. And then what he did is once he got this information, then he went into the wizard in Alfium Designer and he created the footprint for that. And so that's what we call it a kind of a best fit. And he did that for the 0402, 0603, 0206, and 0805. So what are some of the observations that we can make over here? Well, some of the smaller chips to me seem like they really keep very consistent. That there was one little anomaly over here, but generally speaking, the 0402s, 0603s uh, were very consistent here. The 0805s got a little bit, um, if you see, there, there was a little less uh, consistency in here, but still enough to certainly put together a best fit component, right? And when we got to the larger ones, the larger ones seemed like they had a little more variation to it. So it gives you a little idea to, to answer your, the, the original question, are they, are they keeping to a spec? Well, based on their max lengths, they are. And then let's look at the resistor one for a moment. So the resistor one, and I apologize, I actually did this from right to left just to make it fit. But we look at the 0402s, they're really dead on for as many of them as we had. Uh, the, there was a little bit of variation in 0603, but just only one example of that, right, over here. But the fact is that this was pretty consistent. And even the 0805s were remarkably consistent as well. So the smaller the component seems, the more consistent that they are with their tolerances, which is great. So when you get to the larger ones, it gets a little more uh, shaky. So I have two theories on this as to why the larger ones maybe have a little more spread to them. Uh, the first one was that the larger ones would be the first ones that came out back in the late 80s and early 90s. So there was, you know, the, the manufacturing tolerances were probably not as good as they are now. And secondly, the specs may have not necessarily been there at that time, right? That these companies that were getting into it, you know, a lot of times there's that initial competition and then eventually they everybody kind of settles out into a standard uh, that they fit into a little bit better. So th that would be my two reasons for this. So the only thing that does bring this up is that, okay, what this is indicating to me is that there is some um, variation. And that variation can become problematic if the variations are large enough. And some of them to me are parts this small. When you're talking about, you know, till uh, here you have as many as three, three millimeters of um, 0.3 millimeters uh, of difference that that can kind of play a role in the footprints that you're dealing with. Okay, but generally speaking, are they keeping to it? The answer is yes. They are definitely keeping to it. Do they have tolerances and they are they building them a little bit differently? Yes, certainly as well. And that to me is where I have a little bit of pause as to um, how consistent the packages are. Okay, so there was another question. So and so that was kind of interesting because Tom provided me that data and I thought that was fascinating. So I'm going to bring this into the webinar. But when I was putting the webinar together in parallel, I got to this point and I asked myself the question, okay, are they keeping to spec? So I did a slightly different experiment. So what I did was I went to DigiKey, looked up 0402 res chips. There's like 30,000 of them. And then I decided to take one sample per company. So once you kind of get into that initial page where they've got 30,000 chips, you can further define the, the filtering, and that's what I did. So I keep, kept going back and changing out the company so that I could get a sample per company. And I really did just pick a random sample per company. I wasn't trying to find like, I know some of these companies have multiple series, 
of uh, resistor chips. I just want I just wanted to pick one out at random, just also because of the sake of time. But I was able to get quite a few uh, a few examples over here. So what I did on this one was I said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into their data sheets and I'm going to get the width, length, and height that they are showing for an 0402, and if they offer a land pattern because I want to do a follow up on this. So if you look at this, the answer again is that yeah, they're definitely following it because there's just very little variation here. There is, but there's tolerance. And those tolerances over here, again, are concerning because some of these tolerances are literally 10%, you know, up, up to 10% of their, their overall length. That's kind of a lot, right? Uh, and of course, with the width here as well. Now, when it comes to the height, now I know for larger parts, the height can really cause an issue with the, with the lands, but for this over here, other than maybe this 0.63, the height really isn't that critical on an 0402 unless you're really trying to pack this into an iPhone or some really small gadget over here. So I wasn't so concerned about the, the height. I was much more concerned about the length and the width. So again, they, they are definitely, to answer the original question, they're following the packaging specification, but there is tolerance here that we've got to be very uh, careful about. Okay. So that brought up a secondary uh, question. If all these parts are generally the same and they're calling out land patterns, are the land patterns that they're calling out are the same? This is where it gets interesting. So experiment three, same experiment as experiment two that you just saw, same list. And uh, it's the land dimensions based on data sheet or the Altium Designer IPC compliant wizard. So if they said that they had a land pattern, I was going to create, I was going to take the data off their data sheet. If they did not, then I would take the packaging information and I would run it into the IPC compliant wizard. So let's take a look at those results. This is where I thought it got really fascinating. For a part this small, there was an amazing amount of variation. So anything, and if we look down over here, you can kind of see the ranges. So for example, uh, this one had 0.7 millimeters as opposed to 0.4 millimeters, so a range of 0.3 millimeters. So that's a lot for a part that's this small. Same thing with pad Y, and the pitches were the ones that concern me the most, right? Because if the pitch isn't long enough, then it may not, your, the actual quote unquote pins of that, of that chip may not even properly sit on, on these lands. And if you make these two, if you make the pitch too, um, too short, then you may overshoot it for the larger parts. So this is where I was getting a little like, okay, that I can see why there, there could be some concerns about a proper, footprint or a land for an 0402 because everybody's coming up with different results and you can see that over here. So that should give you some pause for concern. Okay. So in conclusion, what did we learn here? Well, we learned that the range of land values for an 0402 is extensive. Okay. The range of the lands, not the components themselves, but the lands are expensive, extensive. And you know what? You may look at that and say, yeah, Paul, I, I get that. But you know what? If I do this really strategically, I can come up with a 0402 that's pretty universal. And I would say, yes, you probably could. But um, what happens with, if the 0402 has that much range to it? The bigger question is, what happens when you get into bigger packages where you now have a fourth variable? And we'll talk about that here in a moment. So let's take a look at an SOIC, which is one step above an 0402 because, yes, and SOIC has a pad X and Y, which the 0402 has, and there is a pitch between the two, but there's now a distance between the rows. So let's take a look at that. So what I did, and we're gonna bring up a polling question over here. Um, I gave you this one. Uh, no, actually the wrong poll. Sorry about that, Christopher, if you, if you can pull that poll back. Um, yeah, I, I forgot to pull this one out. So um, this one is just kind of more of a mental note one. I created 11 SOIC footprints. We did this for a customer, and when we were going through, they specifically asked that we created a SOIC footprint for each one of their ICs. They did not want a global one. And I was more than happy to oblige, and since we're putting together this webinar anyways, I said, this will be really interesting. Let me see how many times they come up with different footprints. And so I, I went through, either the, again, if they had the package, I built it based on the package. If they had the, uh, the, the land information in the data sheet, I built it based off of that. So how many different footprints do you think we needed to make? Do you think it was one, five, eight, or 11? Now, I don't have a poll uh, to, to do this. I was gonna give you guys a poll and do it. I forgot to take this one out and to provide it to Christopher. But uh, um, take a moment to think of which one it might be. 
And if you guessed five, you're correct. It took me, I actually came up with five different SOIC footprints when I created these 11. So let's take a look at those here. Okay, I think I can zoom in here on this a little bit so you can kind of see this. And I can pull this around, I think. If not, that's all right. So here are the five different footprints. The one thing, I'm gonna start off with this. The one thing that they were all consistent with, they were all consistent with the pitch. They were all 1.2, uh, 1.27 millimeters, or yeah, 1.27 millimeters. They were, they were consistent across the board on that. That's the only thing they were consistent about. The one thing that, or the two things that they really varied on was the X direction of the pad. So you had anything that went uh, literally from over 2.2 millimeters to those that were to something as small as 1.8 millimeters. So that's almost a complete millimeter um, of a change. And again, for parts of small, that's that's a bit of area. The one that really shocked me the most was the distance between the rows, where you had something that was, you know, less than five millimeters going as far as 5.6 millimeters. So this is almost seven millimeters of um, uh, 0.7 millimeters of uh, of distance. And that that's again, that's quite a bit for a part that this that is small. Now for the Y values, because of the pitch being consistent, the the Y values were kind of in, within range of each other, not too far off. But that's, again, I think the pitch forces that to happen. So what am I seeing over here? What I'm seeing over here is that if I actually started off with this for he, for this this package over here, I'd probably be very, um, I'd be in a tough spot if I had to take the component, this quote unquote SOIC and have to stick it onto this one, right? Or stick it on, or take this one over here and stick it onto this one. And, and vice versa, with this one being what it is, um, or this, let's say take this one over here, um, I'd be a little bit concerned about taking this part and putting it onto this one here just because of the um, the distance between the rows. So the point I'm trying to make here again is that it looks as though, yes, the packages are consistent, but these companies are calling out different lands. If they're calling out different lands, um, then this one size fits all gets kind of um, treacherous. That's what I'm seeing here based on, on these experiments. Okay. So with that, let me, uh, let me go back over here and we'll jump to the next one. So in summary of the packaging, most manufacturers are following the packaging guidelines. I think I've proven that through uh, two, the two experiments I've shown you here. And there are packaging tolerances that we have to deal with. You know, this just what it is. They're better now because I think there's better manufacturing practices and they're probably using lasers to help with uh, the trimming and whatnot. But there are packaging tolerances you got to deal with. And But there's definitely no consensus of the land patterns found between manufacturers. So, and this to me is a bit concerning because at the end, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, if I'm building something, it behooves me to follow what the manufacturer is saying because that takes the liability off of me and it puts it on their product, right? You, you give them an excuse when uh, you don't follow their land patterns. Okay, so now we can get to the uh, polling question here. So we're gonna talk about lands here, but we'll, we'll put up this, um, um, this poll here. The question basically is, which IPC spec governs the land patterns? So if you answered IPC 7351, you are correct. So 34% of you answered the correct one. And of course, a lot of you did also did the IPC SM782. Uh, I'm gonna talk about that and why that has been superseded by the 7351. Now, can either one be used? And the answer in theory is yes. Uh, and the reason why is because it's not a requirement. And I'll explain why that is not a requirement in a moment. And of course, neither one too. Um, you could you could get away with that one because in the end, if you're gonna do it, if you're doing class C stuff, which we'll talk class, class, pardon, class three uh, products, uh, you are right. Actually, neither one will work. So in a weird sense, all three of the, uh, all four of these are correct. But if we're answering the question, which one governs the land patterns, uh, it is the IPC 7351. So let's see why all these answers in a weird sense are correct. Okay. So let's start off with this one, the IPC SM 782A. It was developed and released in 93, First Amendment in 96, Second Amendment in 99. Okay. And why do we love this spec? I like this spec a lot. And the reason I like it is because it calls out land dimensions. What do I mean by that? If you go to one of the sections, I think it's really section eight that talks about the uh, the, the various type of uh, chip devices like chip resistor, chip capacitors, what they will do is they'll give you a little introduction and then they will give you the dimensions and they will give you a table. And all you need to do is follow the table and this will give you what is called the N component. 
right? It, it's, that's it. There you go. It's easy enough. Now, notice that the smallest it goes is 0402 because the spec was developed in the 90s, all right? That's that's all it was. You just you went to this, you got to this table, you followed you followed what they told you to do, and you were you were good to go. So, well, what did what did that result in? Well, let's talk about that. Number one, it's straightforward, as you just mentioned, it's great. Just here it is, run with it. And secondly, it allowed EDA companies to create generic footprints, and a lot of them. So let's kind of think back to the late 90s and the early 2000s when Mentor, Cadence, and even Altium were trying to vie for you know, market space. And when you're buying for that space, anything and everything that you can provide to the customer to convince them to buy your tool counts. And one of the things that counts is providing a library along with your software. Now, when I worked at Altium, I remember having a conversation with a colleague saying it was just ludicrous to provide this library. And the reason why is because there's a billion components on the market and we're providing a library of 100,000 at that time. Now, obviously Altium has gotten into Octopart and they're really trying to provide um, a huge number of components and they're getting better and better at it all the time. But at that time, they would just bundle it up and they would stick it in as a part of the download operation when you installed Altium Designer and that's how most of them work anyways. So they had to create components and that took a lot of time and energy. But with the 782, it got really easy to create a component. Well, how's that? Well, okay, you just gave manufacturer's name, manufacturer's part number for the parametric data. You would have the exact same a symbol over and over and again, right? If it was a resistor, it's the same symbol. If it's a capacitor, you just had to be a little bit careful as to whether it was uh, polar or not. And then you could stick three footprints on there. You'd put a least, you'd put a nominal, and you'd put a max on there. And it's like, if it was 0402, that's what you say. Oh, it's an 0402. Okay, use those three parts. Just stick it on there and run with it. And you could make a ton of parts very, very quickly by doing that. So for the EDA companies, this is a bit of a godsend. So they could actually say, yes, we're providing these libraries. Here's a library set. And of course, the designer quickly finds out that they'll never find anything that they need in it. They're going to make it anyways. But for the person who's writing the check, that was a box that got checked off. So therefore, there was another reason to buy the product. Right? So that's kind of what happened. Again, here's the max, min, and the least. Right? Low density, nominal material, high density. So that's what they gave you. But there's some concerns. What were those concerns? The problem is, is that L, M, and N are for board real estate concerns, right? densities, max material conditions, right? It assumes that the component fits on all three footprints. As I mentioned before, what were they doing? They were saying, oh, okay, we got this Panasonic part over here. It's an 0402. Stick this symbol on it. Stick these three 0402 footprints on it. You're good to go. They never once checked to see if that actually, if that part would actually fit on any one of those footprints. And it might fit just really well on L, barely fit on N, and not fit on M, right? And those are the kind of things that you're starting to get yourself into trouble with when you start to do this. Because again, L, M, and N were for board real estate concerns. They were not for the components themselves in terms of fitment. Okay? So the footprints are being blindly applied. And of course, also too, no one's really consulting the data sheet because if they're giving you this library, now of course they always give you a disclaimer. Right. Every library out there, third-party library, Altium, there's a disclaimer sheet somewhere on their website that says, like, look, we're providing these, you know, as a service to you. Uh, there's no, um, you know, there's no uh, guarantee that they are correct. You know, use at your own risk. You know, we we, are, we cannot be held liable for them. But that, you know, the typical legal yada, 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 if you want to call it that, right? So no consulting uh, of the data sheets, and we just use them. And you know what? Let's talk about classes here. So for class one products like uh, basically toys, right? This is probably worked just fine for you, okay? Because what's a class one product? Class one product is that, you know, it's supposed to last, right? There's, there should be some quality to it, but if it breaks, it's not gonna be the end of the world. It's not gonna cause you economic harm. It's not gonna be life or limb, right? And there'll be some tear shed probably by a little one who broke their toy, but that's really the extent of it, right? You get into class two products, you're now you're talking about your cell phone, your computer, you know, your car, uh, or, and then even class cars might even be class three at this point. But uh, a lot of your products that you have in your house are probably class two products. And when they break, they're a hassle. Right? And so you're starting to get a little bit more chance of using LMNN on these things. And of course, if you're in class three products, this is your military grade stuff. This is your avionics stuff. This is your medical stuff, where if this stuff breaks, someone can lose a life or there's literally millions of dollars on the line when the stuff breaks over here. So in this state over here, 
L, M, and N should really never be used. It should always be um, based on the manufacturer's recommendation. So that's that's the idea behind L, M, and N. So you, can you still get away with L, M, and N? Sure, it depends on the class that you're working in. Right? But people are just blindly taking L, M, and N and, and distributing them across all of these here. Now, I think on the class three products, they probably wouldn't have gotten there because usually in, cl in a class three environment, uh, there's a lot of procedure and workflow that would I would have been prevented that from happening. But I think for a lot of us who just work in these companies where the libraries have long been dismissed, librarians have been long dis dismissed and you're told to build your own stuff, it's a very easy to just fall on that, that idea of, okay, there it is. I'll just use this, I'll throw it in there, I'm good to go. So that's the concern. All right. Now, here's the rub. The rub is that the specification was only, now it's not just was, it is too. So any of the specifications the IPC puts out are only recommendations and they do if you read the introduction on their specs they will always say that these are just recommendations they were put together by a standards committee for best industry practices and we cannot be held liable use you know at your own risk that tip that typical legal ease stuff we just talked about before the, the ipc does it as well so don't ever consider this to be a requirement it's only a recommendation here's the other thing too the ipc sm 782a was superseded by the IPC 7351. If you go onto the IPC website and you look up this document, it will literally say next to it, it was superseded by this document. So the IPC will, is no longer supporting this and it's out there now, but they're not gonna charge you for it, whereas they'll charge you for this one over here. Okay. So let's talk a moment about the IPC 7351. It was released in 2005, updated in 2010. People are waiting for the new update. Now, I'm gonna kind of interject over here on some stuff that you may or may not know about. So a couple of years ago, the IPC dismissed the designer's council. So, and if you really understand the IPC, the IPC actually is really more on the manufacturing side of things. They're the ones who call out specifications for equipment and for workflow procedures for both assembly and fabrication. And of course, they have a keen interest on the design side because obviously if we don't teach people on the design side, how to do it right, then they're going to send garbage to the manufacturers and they want to make sure that you send things that are manufacturable, DFM, DFT, those type of things, designed for test, designed for manufacturing. And so there, a lot of the specs were coming from the design side were set up by the designer's council. They dismissed a designer's council and I don't want to get into the, the details of it, but the fact is they said they didn't want them anymore. And in addition to dismissing the designer's council, they also dismissed the, the IPC chapters across the U.S. So what happened to all those people? Well, they, they turned into another organization called the PCEA. And the PCEA now is kind of in a weird sense, kind of competing with the IPC, but they're on the design side where the IPC is really more, more focused on the, uh, on the manufacturing side of things. Okay. Now, is the PCEA putting out documentation? The answer is not really. They seem to be more focused on education than they are necessarily on, on specs. So, now that IPC has lost a number of these individuals who are working on the standards committee, I don't know when they're gonna to put together another document or if they're gonna supersede this document at this time. So that's why you haven't seen an update in quite a long time. But yeah, there's some interesting things going on in our industry over here. And I don't wanna get into tour details. It's just, unfortunately, there has been some disruption of, this, of, of the standard committees because of these um, actions by dismissing the designers council. With that being said, we're gonna assume that the IPC 7351, which they still sell, so therefore it must be still the standing document, um, is the one that we ought to be following. Now, the IPC 7351 is a radical departure from the 782. Why is that? It abandons the call out for specific dimensions. So those tables that we looked at earlier, or the table we looked at earlier, gone. It isn't there anymore. Here's the crutch of it. Equations based on package dimensions. There, that's what it is. If you go to the first part of the IPC 7351, they talk about a set of equations to come up with the lands based off of the package dimensions. As a matter of fact, if you purchase the 7351, you get a land calculator with it. Uh, you can download this land calculator. Now, do you need to buy it? The answer is no. If you're using Altium, these other calculators exist. So there's Altium IPC compliant wizard follows the 7351. Um, if you take parts down from Octopart, by the way, uh, they also do follow 7351 as well. I think they've, uh, I, that's my understanding of that. 
but uh, again, just because you're following this, there, there's some things we want to be careful of, right? When you're taking things from third parties. Uh, also, the LP uh, viewer, mentor graphics. I think this sometimes they allow it to be free. Sometimes you got to uh, find a login. It, 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 you know, mentors just that one of those type of companies there. But if you really do want to see one, I think you can download this thing called the LP viewer, and it's based off of the 7351. Okay. So that's the key thing right up here. Equations based on package dimensions. So that brings us to our recommendations. Now that we have, let me make sure I didn't miss anything there. Um, now, now that we've kind of looked at the packages, realized that not all the packages are consistent, now and that they're calling out different lands in their data sheets, and now that we realize that the 782 is really not a document that we ought to be following, that the IPC recommendation is based them off of the package. So what are our recommendations? So that's number one, assess what you're making. Right, so we're not saying necessarily abandon what the library is, because if your library has been working for you and you know what the type of product you're making, you, you'll likely get away with what I'll call blind reuse. You know, if you've been using this and it's been working for you, then okay, it's probably going to work. Uh, it's where you get into class two, where yes, there's still reuse, but I wouldn't say a blind reuse. Right, for example, uh, for reuse, let's say a lot of these chip companies, uh, chips and the capacitors, they come in a series, right? So I would say that build it to the series, right? It, I, there's no reason to build each and every single one out by itself. If there's a series out there, make that series, make that footprint available for the entire series. For class three, you really ought to be working off the manufacturer's recommendation for liability purposes. Okay? So that's that's the first recommendation. Assess what you're making. Secondly, we really at the end of the day, here at Nine Connects, when we work with a customer, follow the data sheet. And I know that that's painful because that means, oh man, I got to build one for each and every single component. But look, if they provide the land, use it. Otherwise, your product takes on the liability. That's the key thing. And if there, if there is an issue over there, and and it's already happened before, I can't get specifics about it. But there was an in instance where um, a, comp a company sued a chip manufacturer because they're claiming that their chips were not poorly were, were made poorly, and then. Uh, during the discussions, ultimately, it was found out that they weren't using the um, the recommended land patterns and data sheet. They're using the IPC recommended patterns, and uh, in the end, uh, there there was no liability on the part of the chip manufacturer because uh, the uh, and if you really read the chip manufacturer's uh, disclaimers, they'll tell you if you're not following our spec, then you're you're taking on the liability. And by the way, here's the key thing. It doesn't take that much more time to do this. There's a weird, I'll call it a paradox that happens when we try to spend our time trying to find this stuff online as opposed to doing it ourselves. So let's take a moment to look at that. Okay. The time it takes to create, as far as I'm concerned, is the time it takes to confirm it. Why? Because you got to search it, which is going to take you some, a, a couple of minutes. It may not take you that long, depending on how, how it is, right? You, then you got to download it. Then you got to add it to your library. So it's a copy and paste feature. Then you got to verify the lands anyways, if you're doing your due diligence. Then you got to have it conform to company standards. Now, in some cases you can say, well, okay, I'll just take a, an example, one that I've already gotten, I'll just delete the other lands and put these in there. And you can do those kind of things and that's that will work. And then of course you have a 3D model that you're going to want to put in there as well. This takes a lot of time. Guess what? That's the same amount of time to create it. Right? That's that you're gonna do this, almost the same thing anyways. So if you're gonna take these things from a third party vendor who's not gonna, by the way, they guarantee they're not gonna guarantee them. So in the end, it's gonna be up to you to, to verify it. You may as well build it on your own anyways. Footprint templates. This is one thing that we do quite often. Um, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be a formal template, but the idea is that there is a component or a footprint. Let's not call it a component, let's talk about a footprint. If you have a um if you have a footprint in your library that you can clone, then clone it and then turn it into the one that you need because it gives you a really great start point. And if the land information is given, here's the one thing that we can recommend. So yeah, this, this isn't totally dead. Here's the idea behind this is that if you take the 782 and you create a very generic part, you make it very clear that this is a generic template. And then from there, you clone this and then you adjust the lands accordingly. The rest of the stuff like the silks, and the mechanical layer should all fall into place automatically because it's a part of this template that you put together. It's just a matter of adjusting the lands. Okay. And that's a fast way of doing it. And of course, you do want to import a new 3D model. Now, again, if you're kind of, it depends on the class you're in. 
if you're building some a board that's going to be fit in a really large enclosure and you're not really worried about the the z axis all right whatever model you throw in there is going to be fine if you're putting into something that's very slim that's going to fit in someone's pocket well then yeah you're probably worried about heights there so you know use use your discretion as necessary for what you're trying to do and the last recommendation we'll give you is a naming convention so we know that the ipc has a whole naming convention i've got two issues with it though the first one is incredibly long and somewhat cryptic and secondly without an update newer packages are not defined so you got to get kind of uh you got to be kind of uh smart about it but right so there's a newer package so well what packages that really fall under now, of course, if you're not following it to a T, then you just call it the new package and move on with it. But we found that another way it worked really well and wanted to share that with you. So our recommendation is component type, package type, manufacturer, manufacturer's part number, and notes. Okay. And so the, why do we put it in this order over here? Because if we are going to build a resistor, and I'm looking through footprints, and I want to use one as an example, or if I want to see if I already have something similar to it, or maybe it's a part of a series, then I can sort this really easy based off of this. So if it's a resistor, then I can sort based off of the resistor. The package type is again, it would be R0402, R0603, or SOIC, so on and so forth. So it looks something like this. So if I did have it, like let's say again, a Panasonic and they were ERJ series, rather than saying, okay, this is having this one multiple times because they have the same manufacturer, right? I can just call this ERJ series. So if I'm looking through my list over here, I'm like, oh, I have an ERJ part. Great, I've already got the footprint for it. I know it's going to work because the data sheet calls out, right? It's a data sheet that calls out literally a hundred different uh, values, but all the rest of the packaging is the exact same. I'm good to go with it. Or it would look like something like this. And then, of course, with the notes, because we have had ex exceptions where if there is something that say like customer, like let's say um, something modified or modified for such and such, you can add that in there as well. We found that this to be just as effective as coming up with a really fancy uh, long name with it. So, the conclusions, the two underlying assumptions that we made manufacturers keep the dimensions of good parking package type. There's a truth to that, but there's just too much. There's it's, it's the lands that they're not keeping to, right? And then the 782 is the governing document for the lands, and that's just not true either at this point. So, that we know that packages vary because of tolerances, their lands vary, which I should have put over here as well. And the specs are based on package dimensions. When I'm talking about specs, I'm talking about the IPCs. IPC spec is actually based on package dimensions. So hopefully that gives you some food for thought there. And uh, we'll go into our next polling question. Okay, so almost 50% of you are still making them yourself, and that's just great. Um, and hopefully we've given you some food for thought moving forward. And if you're doing any restoration work, or fixing things in your library. Now you have uh, something else to worry about, right? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, and then 19% from a company librarian. That's great if you have that that resource. I think that's a really important one. Um, and of course, from the company library, uh, 24 um, there. So there's there's the poll for you. So with that being said, I'd like to spend a few moments talking about 9.connects, and I'll take a moment or two to look at any questions that may have come up. Uh, you're here for a reason. And so why were you here? Because an opportunity to finally get these rumors, half troops, and facts straightened out. And look, I mean, even we and here at 9.connects, we thought like we knew everything and where we are working with a customer. And this whole webinar comes out of not realizing that the N0402 is really not, not a thing, right? That we really have to do something bigger and better for our customers uh, than to blindly take something from an old spec. You have a uh, concern that your library may have some questionable methods. Uh, maybe following questionable methods, right? Maybe you're using the older spec or maybe you're doing things, again, just blindly accepting something without really looking to see if it follows the, the manufacturer's recommendations. Or you're just trying to rebuild your library and, and that makes sense, right? Because probably you have stuff all over the place and everybody did things to their own whims. And so you're trying to figure out, well, how do we standardize on something there? So th these are the reasons. And let's talk about 9.connects. We do things like uh, training an Altium designer, and we do our PCB foundations training. We also do uh, board work as well, but uh, obviously we're doing library services. So let's talk about those for a moment. We do a lot of restoration work. It's amazing how, how many people are coming to us now to get the libraries cleaned up and moving. And these are the things that come up. This is the stuff that surfaces when we have these conversations with them. Okay? And it gives us amazing angle of perspective. And think about the perspective that we get from this. The thing is, is that 
how many people work on multiple libraries of different companies? That's that's kind of rare, but yet we see them all the time. So we it shows us an angle of perspective that most other people won't see, where you may be working in one library because you're working on your company's workflow. We see it from a lot of different workflows and perspectives. So it, it gives us these perspectives. This webinar was the result of that simple request to build, and uh, for example, this end footprint. We also do library sustainment. Right? So we a lot of people say, you built it for us, can you maintain it? And we're more than happy to do that, right? So an opportunity to tackle challenging components. And that's the other thing I want to mention here too, that sometimes some of these components will just burn up a half a day for you, right? If they're really of any complexity. So what do we provide? Well, of course, obviously we're going to provide the footprint accordingly. I want to show you a few other things that we provide as well. We definitely provide 3D graphics where we can, right? If we're, we're not going to create a 3D graphics for fiducial, for example, right? But we do our, our graphics and we provide the max tolerances. If you go out onto the websites like 3D Content Central and all those other places, they'll give you tolerances based off of average, right? Um, but we actually always build to the max tolerances because we want to make sure that we can fit, fit these parts onto those footprints. Uh, and we draw them regardless of how complex. So here's one that we recently drew. It's a conical uh, inductor, which I thought was a really cool uh, device. Uh, and then also when we do our our connectors, we do it with corresponding mates. So there there it is over here. Uh, and the reason we do that is because we want to make sure that there's enough clearance. Because how many times you've been burned where you put something on it, it looked great, and then later on you realize you couldn't plug it in because you didn't give enough clearance. It happens all the time. So when we do this, we like to do the mating connector with it as well. And of course, the, man, the we do to the manufacturer's land recommendations, but happy to build to the customer's desires. Now, the particular customer we were talking about with this end thing, why were they able to do what, what we ultimately provided for them is because they also do the assembly. So they can get immediate feedback when things aren't working. Um, if you're working with a CM, then you may want to take a different approach to it, right? But so to each their own, and we're more than happy to build to what, what the customer wants. And if you want more information about what we do, please do uh, take a look at our website under especially library services over here and you can see all the things that we've written up and all the thoughts that we come across anytime we come across something that's interesting we do add it up over here in a weird sense it's kind of like a blog but yet it's another reason why we want to show people why it's important uh, to consider certain things when you're putting together a library I really thank you for your time i'll look through the questions over here and if um, there's something i need to answer offline i'll certainly do that for you Again, I want to thank you so much for joining me here today, uh, and uh, we will contact you when we're ready with our next webinar. So enjoy the enjoy the day, and again, thank you for attending.